Okay, uh, thank you very, very much indeed for this uh, medal and award. I'm very, very grateful to all of you, actually. And it's really nice to see so many people over here. Now, I'm going to talk about uh, extremely short and extremely long heat treatments. Um, if by extremely short, I mean of the order of milliseconds. And by extremely long, I mean 10 days. And that immediately will raise uh, questions in your mind that can we afford a 10 day heat treatment? Milliseconds doesn't sound uh, very much, but can we afford 10 days of heat treatment? And bear in mind that we are not talking about, you know, very small samples that you do in the university. We want to make hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of tons of material. So I'm going to just uh, very briefly define what we mean by heat treatment. Any kind of heat treatment that you do will have the movement of atoms. Right? And in the solid states, atoms have a difficulty in moving because they are lying in nice equilibrium potential wells, which are separated by uh, an activation barrier Q. And in the case of iron, that activation barrier is quite large. It's of the order of 286,000 joules per mole of atoms. Of course, the atoms are vibrating at about 10 to the 13 times per second, so they will attempt to get over this barrier. And the classical relationship is this Boltzmann relationship, which gives you the probability of an atom jumping over the barrier. And there's a time here, because the more attempts you make, eventually you might make it across that barrier because there's a distribution of energies. So it's convenient to define the potency, the strength of heat treatment by a very simple parameter that it scales directly with the time because you know, you're attempting to get over that barrier. And the longer the time you have, the greater the chance of getting over the barrier. And the probability of getting over the barrier which depends on this height Q. So going back to my introduction where I talked about 80 milliseconds and 10 days. So supposing, and I will give you examples of this, supposing we are transforming at 600 degrees centigrade for 80 milliseconds and at 200 degrees centigrade for 10 days, then which one do you think is the more powerful heat treatment? Is it the one lasting for 10 days or the one lasting for 80 milliseconds? <laughs> Okay, raise your hands if you think it's 200 degrees centigrade 10 days. Wow, well, you're, you're all very clever because look, here are some calculations. Uh, 210 days and 600 degrees C, 80 milliseconds. And you can see that this is orders of magnitude more powerful than 200 degrees 10 days. So, you know, if you are from industry and your boss says, look, I just cannot cope with 10 days of heat treatment, you should explain that actually it's using a lot less uh, of your heat treatment power than the heat treatment which you carry out at 600 degrees centigrade. Uh, this is basically the temperature at which you cook pizza. Okay. So heat treatment is about the movement of atoms and uh, temperature scales with an exponential and that's why we have such a large difference whereas time scales linearly. Now, iron is uh, the most interesting element uh, we can think about. Actually, it's the most stable element in the universe. So eventually, our whole galaxy will turn just into iron. So if you don't work on iron, you don't have a hope in the future. Uh, but back on Earth, we have three different kinds of iron. You have the body-centered cubic form, the face-centered cubic form. So these, I think, everybody is familiar with, ferrite and austenite. And this form exists right in the center of the Earth where there is a huge pressure and a temperature of 6,000 degrees centigrade because it's stable at about 130,000 atmospheres of pressure. Of course, you can add alloying elements to make uh, the hexagonal form of iron stable and the so-called um, uh, trip steels, and, uh, which contain a very large concentration of manganese, can sometimes transform into what we call epsilon iron. But I'm going to talk mostly about these two forms of iron, which represent the vast majority of the 1.4 billion tons of steel we use every year. 
Now, the interesting thing is that we can get this crystal structure, this crystal structure to change into this in the solid state. Okay? Even though the atomic arrangements are so different, you don't need diffusion at all to go from this to this. I'll explain how. Or you can break all the bonds and rearrange the atoms into this form, which would require some movement of atoms. Okay, so that kind of a transformation where we break all the bonds and reconstruct the crystal structure is called reconstructive, requires diffusion. Whereas when we deform the parent structure into the product, that's called a displacive transformation, does not require diffusion. And the clever thing in iron, as soon as you add carbon, okay, forget about all the other alloying elements, you get a wide variety of transformation products, uh, those which grow by uh, the diffusion of atoms over the scale of the size of your structure, and those which do not involve diffusion. There is a slight complication that carbon can diffuse something like eight orders of magnitude faster than iron itself because it lies in the holes in the crystal structure. And there are transformations which involve the diffusion of carbon but not of iron. So just to revise a little bit, these are reconstructive transformations. You see here the uh, what we call allotriomorphic ferrite. That means its shape doesn't reflect its crystal structure. It's basically growing wherever it's easier to grow. You have the perlite transformation where you have the cementite and ferrite intimately mixed and it forms in the form of a spheroid and you have the massive transformation where the grains of ferrite completely ignore the austenite grain boundaries. So these are austenite grain boundaries here and these are the ferrite grain boundaries. The transformation is so fast and because it is involves diffusion it can grow right across austenite grain boundaries and the ferrite grain size is actually bigger than the austenite grain size. So it's known as massive ferrite. Uh, in contrast, uh, so before I go into in contrast, this is another sort of diagram which helps define heat treatment. Here I'm plotting the diffusion distance of iron, and this is one micrometer here, uh, against uh, temperature for a variety of time periods. So if I want to produce a microstructure scale which is 100 micrometers, I could do that by transforming at around 400 degrees C for 10,000 hours, or at 600 degrees C for 100 hours, and so on. So it's a combination of time and temperature. If I want a finer scale, then I need to go uh, to a lower transformation temperature. Alternately, if I want to homogenize the material, because every commercial material that we make will contain variations in chemical composition. And those variations can happen over various length scales. So for example, uh, we still have ingot casting for very special steels, for example, bearing steels, uh, which uh, um, I'm very pleased to see here. Um, um, where you can have segregation over a distance of a meter. Now, if if you have segregation of over a distance of meter, then you will require a very large amount of time to eliminate it. So you don't actually bother to eliminate it because it's it's just too long for diffusion to homogenize the material. Now the second kind of phase transmission does not require diffusion at all. And I'm going to illustrate this. So let's imagine that we have a square pattern of atoms. And we want to change that into an inclined, uh, an oblique pattern. Then you see that in doing this, I don't require any diffusion at all. I am, I'm not breaking any bonds. Okay, simply homogeneously deform the parent into the product. But notice that the shape of the object that is transformed will have changed, and it's quite a dramatic change. Now this is real. So. This is a sample of austenite. Uh, these are the austenite grain boundaries. And we are going to transform it into bainite. And you will see the change in shape exactly as I illustrated schematically. So the sample is now cooling down, and you will see massive upheavals on the surface. So these upheavals represent shear strains of about a quarter. Okay? And a typical elastic strain, when you load a piece of steel, 
is of the order of 10 to the minus 3. So these are massive. So if you didn't have a magnification, this would be like the formation of a mountain range. Okay? They are massive upheavals. Now the consequence of this is that there's a lot of strain energy. So imagine these upheavals are happening inside the steel. They'll be pushing against all the other crystals. Okay? Therefore, there will be a lot of strain energy. And the way that the system copes with that strain energy is to form as very thin plates. I've got a video on my YouTube channel explaining why a thin plate minimizes strain energy, but I won't explain it here. So all the transformation products which involve a change in the crystal structure by homogeneous deformation will be in the form of thin plates. So here you are. This is Wiedmann-Sladen ferrite. You can see thin plates. This is uh, bainite. Uh, now, the structure of bainite is more complicated than you see on this optical micrograph, and you can guess that by the fact that this is etching dark. That means there are lots and lots of interfaces inside that black plate that we see. I'll show you that later. And the mountain side here etches light because it doesn't have as much of interfacial area per unit volume as the bainite. And this is a uh, uh, Martin side. All of them form in the form of thin plates. If you have mechanical twinning, it's exactly the same. It's a very large shear deformation, causes a lot of strain energy, and mechanical twins are very fine and tapered at the edges. Okay, so there's a reason for that tapering, which is explained on the video on my website. So now I'm going to go on to explain a very clever inventor in the US, a guy called uh, Gary Cola. I don't know if he's here or not. Uh, but if you are here, identify yourself. Uh, so I met him uh, about 15 years ago. And he, at that point, knew nothing about metallurgy at all. Right? He, was just, he had a very small factory in which he was making some steel components for various people. And here he is, Gary Kohler. And he invented what's known as flash bainite. And, you know, lots of people simply didn't believe that he was producing bainite in 80 milliseconds. And he didn't invent any alloys. He was using standard steels. And basically, this is what he did. So he has a piece of steel passing between rollers with, originally, he was flame heating this, okay, uh, and then immediately going into water. So obviously, many, many professors thought this would lead simply to martensite. But he claimed it was bainite. And this process, he managed to patent, actually. Uh, you know, it's very difficult in steel to get patents which are profitable. Okay? You can get patents to protect yourself, but this uh, made him a lot of money. And the process is called flash bainite. Now, why does it work? Using standard steel, which contains, you know, something like 0.2 weight percent carbon and lots of alloying elements, why does it get bainite when you know, normally when you quench the steel, you would get mud inside. The temperature plot is like this, that you have quite rapid heating and then very fast cooling. Uh, the timing is of the order of 80 milliseconds over the transformation temperature range. And you manage to produce properties which are very, very good. So here are the uh, elongation levels at very high strength levels. So you know, in the car industry, there's a big demand for these very strong steels, which serve as uh, A or B pillars in the construction of the body in white, because we have to protect against side impact. Uh, I was actually going to Poland from Cambridge uh, to Luton Airport and in a taxi, and a car hit us from the side at high speed. Nobody was injured. We all walked out of the car. I walked to the airport. And that's the amazing things that you guys are doing. Yeah? People don't realize that a car is not the same as a car even 20 years ago. So the weight of a car has actually gone up because of this uh, safety protection. So basically, the whole body deforms, but you leave your passenger compartment more or less intact. The cars are completely written off. Now, why does this work? Why? Uh, it turns out that it is actually bainite. Several universities investigated the material. And um, if I go back to this 
slide, I mentioned that martensite, you, you can actually distinguish martensite and bainite optically if you want, right? Don't need a transmission electron microscope. You can see that martensite actually is very light because it's untampered and has a smaller amount of interface per unit volume than bainite. So, all the transmission electron microscopy has been done, but I'm not going to show you that. Uh, this is the starting condition of the anneal sheet that he buys, which has these cementite particles in it. And when he heats it rapidly, the cementite particles dissolve, but the carbon does not homogenize. So you're left with more or less carbon-free austenite and small regions which are rich in carbon, which transform into this light etching martensite, and the rest of it transforms very rapidly into bainite. So I drew this schematic to illustrate. This is the anneal condition. When you heat it up rapidly, the particles dissolve, but the carbon remains localized because of the rapidity of the process. And then these lean regions transform into bainite, and the rich regions transform into martensite. So here, uh, I met him again about two months ago, and he carried his steel samples to the conference, okay? Now, you know, I love steel, but it's heavy, okay? But he's so dedicated. So this is a component that he made for the car industry, for the pillar, and here is a crush bar, okay? You know, when you have an impact, there's a mechanism of absorbing that energy by uh, a device like this made out of steel, which then crushes up into something much smaller and as a consequence absorbs a lot of energy. So it's possible to produce bainite, which is strong, in 80 milliseconds. Now this is uh, the mechanism of bainite that I've worked for now nearly 40 years on, and it's summarized on a single slide. Uh, there's nothing more to it. Uh, it basically forms exactly like martensite without any diffusion, but then the carbon escapes rapidly into the surrounding austenite and precipitates as cementite particles. And this is why it etches dark, because you've got all this structure which is absent in untempered martensite. Uh, the time for this diffusion is of the order of a quarter of a second. And you can create these beautiful structures. Uh, uh, sorry. Um, so you can kill the reaction at this stage by adding silicon. So you prevent the precipitation of cementite, then the carbon will stabilize the austenite, and you will have a duplex microstructure, which consists of extremely fine platelets of bainitic ferrite separated by these regions of austenite. So we got rid of the brittle cementite, which in high-strength steels, which are clean, you know, the cementite is the fracture initiator. And this has a strength of the order of uh, 1,600 uh, megapascals and can be produced in continuous cooling. And the first application of that in, uh, was in rails. So conventional rails are made out of politic structure. This is made of completely carbide-free bainite and it's a hardness of between, depending on your cooling conditions, between 300, and, uh, 300 vickers and 450 vickers. And if, uh, if you look at the rolling contact fatigue resistance, you know, when, when you push onto a surface, you actually get a stress which is maximum, shear stress which is maximum under the surface. So every time a wheel goes over the surface, it's causing damage under the surface, and eventually that rolls off, I'm uh, sorry, flakes off. So that's called rolling contact fatigue, and these are full-scale tests conducted in Poland. Yeah. My colleagues there are from Poland. Uh, we, we stopped these tests because the Polish Institute charges a lot of money for doing these tests. <laughs> okay. um, but it performs better than um, conventional rays. And it's the only material which also reduces wear on the wheels. Now in Britain we have a crazy system where the track is owned by a different company to the rolling stock. So if you improve the rails and you damage the wheels more, then there is trouble, okay? And this is inside the channel tunnel. Now people tell me, uh, when, when you travel in the channel tunnel, you can't see anything. And I used to joke, it's because you, that I want to show you the water that's leaking in, right? 
but actually there isn't any water leaking in, but these are the rails installed in the channel tunnel. Now the structure that I showed you uh, can be manipulated in many ways, you know, so if you don't need 1600 megapascals or if you want greater number of megapascals, you can alter the scale of the structure. And a few years ago we were asked to do this design where you have a strength of 1600 megapascals and elongation of 15%. There's a lot of demand for these parameters because 15% elongation at that value in a mass-produced steel is quite difficult. And the transformation time is seven minutes and I'll explain to you why. So the material is to be produced in a continuous annealing line. So it's massive production of sheet steel, which then goes into a galvanizing bath, which is at a temperature of about 460 degrees centigrade. And then it's coiled and the transformation would happen inside the coil. So we created uh, some mathematical models. Uh, these are models for transformation temperature versus transformation time. So this defines a domain. I cannot actually produce the bainitic microstructure if you want me to produce it at this time and this temperature. It's not possible. Okay? But this domain defines what is possible. And in principle, we could produce something in seven minutes uh, over the temperature range that was specified and it would have the strength level that we are looking for. And we did that. And here you are, this is a, a stress versus strain curve, which meets, within three years, it meets the requirements of production on a continuous annealing line. But let's imagine that we want even higher strength. How can we get it? Well, there was this micrograph which was published many years ago, 1997, where they took a steel, transformed it at 420 degrees centigrade, and then suddenly changed the temperature to about 270 degrees centigrade. And look, this is of the order of half a micrometer. The lower temperature part is of the order of much less. Okay? So, basically, the lower the transformation temperature, the thinner will be the plates. So imagine that we had to design a steel which is nanocrystalline, very strong, tough and cheap. Okay? The sort of things you write in research proposals and hope for the best. Uh, but, so I want to put some substance on this. Uh, this is a picture that I took in Alberta at the oil sands mines. And just to show you the scale, uh, there I am. Okay? And that's one tire. So I want to be able to make very, very large components, which are large in all dimensions. All right? um, what do we mean by nanocrystalline? Well, everyone's heard of carbon nanotubes. We've got to get a structure which is finer than carbon nanotubes. And cheap, uh, I'm glad you don't have bottled, well, we have bottled water there. Uh, the tap water is perfectly okay, but we are happy to spend money on bottled water. So if we make it as cheap as bottled water, weight for weight or volume, then we are okay. So the question to ask is, how can I get to, you know, plates which are 20 nanometers thick? What transformation temperature can, is the lowest transformation temperature I can go to? Now, we've developed a lot of theory for this, uh, which I won't bore you with, but basically, we've got to maintain a gap between bainite and martensite and that's not possible if you have very low carbon steels uh, the bainite transformation just disappears you only get the martensite and according to this I could actually produce bainite at room temperature this line here is 25 degrees centigrade okay. if I have the right sort of carbon concentration I could produce bainite at room temperature the catch is that it would take me about 100 years right? now even even you know, I wouldn't bother with that because I wouldn't see what I've produced in my lifetime unless the biologists get it right. So we produced a practical material which transformed at a pizza temperature, 200 degrees centigrade, in 10 days. And this is an optical micrograph. doesn't show anything in particular except that um, it's isotropic. The plates are pointing in many directions. So now I'm going to show you a picture at a much higher magnification, uh, which can be misleading because you're looking at very small regions. 
It's fantastic. So, are you ready for this? Okay, take a deep breath. This is, obviously I've used artificial colors, just like the astronomers do when they've detected a small white speck and they want to show you that it's really a galaxy. Uh, so, these are the plates of bainite and that's the austenite and this is a carbon nanotube at the same magnification. Produced by transformation at 200 degrees centigrade for 10 days and you can see that we can produce it in large quantities, in large dimensions. These are shafts for air aircraft engines. Uh, this is the component here. And this is very large here. And it, it's, it's going around at a very high speed, so there's a large torque. And if it breaks, then the shaft must be able to bend plastically to temporarily accommodate the vibrations that would otherwise bring the engine down and maybe the plane down. So there are, there's someone here from Rolls-Royce that can tell you a better story, but sometimes we do experiments where we have an engine running and we put an explosive charge here, blow it up, just to see what happens to the shaft and to the containment. There's a video of this on my website that experiment costs 15 million pounds, okay? So you don't do it very often. But you know, we enjoy playing with big toys. Okay. Uh, this is the shaft being heat treated, the uh, nanostructured vein shaft being heat treated in Germany. First you austenitize and then you put it into a salt bath at 200 degrees centigrade, take it out from there and put it into an oven for 10 days. And there's absolutely no problem with uh, a company like Rolls-Royce giving a 10-day heat treatment. You can produce it in mass, so these are actual coils of this material. The coils are in the politic condition because you have to uncoil them and then heat treat. You cannot mess about with it once it's got a strength of 2000 megapascals. And this is a totally new armor which performs extremely well. And the performance parameter is called ballistic mass efficiency. That means it's the mass of ordinary armor to defeat a given threat divided by that to, uh, mass of the test material. So it takes account of density, and this outperforms everything except alumina, which can only take one shot. Now, if you add holes to the armor, it actually improves it, right? Because, you know, the projectile gets deflected or it crumbles at the edges. And there are movies on my website of this. So, without the holes, the ballistic mass efficiency is about 2. If you put about 50% holes, the ballistic mass efficiency is 3. So it follows that if you put 100% holes, the ballistic mass efficiency will be 4 and it will be stealth armor. Okay. Now, there are limitations to this material, serious limitations. And you cannot weld it, yet, so it will crack spontaneously. It's a, it's a high carbon material. The martensite that you produce in the heat effector zone is high carbon and it's impossible to weld. There are very, very clever people who have techniques to weld this, but they're not practical at all. Okay, practical processes. So what we need to do, and uh, some years ago when I gave a talk uh, to Professor Zock in um, Cologne, I identified these targets, okay, that we want to produce a steel with an impossible combination of properties, uh, same properties as the armor, uh, ductility, the armor also has ductility, and even at very high strain rate. So the Air Force Research Lab, there's someone here from the Air Force Research Lab, did the very high strain rate test and showed that the strength and ductility are maintained, but this is tricky. Okay? You want Charpy impact energy of about 40 joules at minus 40 degrees centigrade for a material which has a strength in excess of 2,000 megapascals. And this is tricky, weldable. Now, this was, uh, uh, I think it was two years ago that I gave the talk in Cologne, right? Yeah. Since then, we've finished this project and we've achieved these targets. And Tata Steel in India is now producing this material on a large scale, 
so that they can do full scale ballistic and blast resistance tests. Okay, um, what's the time? yeah, I've got some time. Yeah. So, of course, it's very nice to have some products, but it's also very interesting because this nanostructured material has inspired a lot of scientific research. And uh, I explained to you the mechanism uh, that the carbon escapes in a matter of seconds, yeah, because the solubility of carbon in the ferrite is quite low. So you can imagine that this is like a tempering reaction, but we are not precipitating carbides because of the silicon. So the bainite tempers itself, uh, the martensite tempers itself, and that's what we call bainite. So the solubility of carbon in ferrite, which is in contact with austenite, is incredibly low. And many years ago, I did experiments to measure the carbon using the atom probe technique. And to my surprise, so here you can see individual atoms of carbon. They are located mostly in austenite. But in here, there is actually a concentration of carbon which is far in excess of what the phase diagram would tell you, even though the transformation time is such that the carbon should have escaped. So I attributed this at the time to carbon being located at dislocations. But then there was this very bright person, Francisca, who is using much better atom probe equipment now available. So I think my original work was in 1981 and her work began uh, in 2007 using the atom probe at Oak Ridge National Laboratories and sure enough the carbon is at dislocations but in regions of the ferrite away from the dislocations there's a high saturation of carbon okay something like 0.38 percent of carbon just refuses to go out of the material you can see that yeah 0.22 weight percent I mean that's ridiculous you've given plenty of time for carbon to escape into the austenite. Okay. You do any calculation you like, there's plenty of time, and yet it wants to stay there. And, uh, you know, I've mentioned this before to Professor Doc, but he gave me sleepless nights. Why is this happening? I could not explain it. <coughs> so, in one of the dreams, uh, you put together two unit cells of austenite, <coughs> and inside that, you can draw a different unit cell of austenite, which is body-centered tetragonal. There's no change in crystal structure, we're just using a different unit cell. But it becomes obvious that if I deform this, compress it along here, expand along here, it changes into ferrite, body-centered cubic ferrite. And that's called the Bain strain, uh, 1924, by Edgar Bain. <coughs> the consequence is that any carbon atoms which are located at random in the austenite will end up along one set of the axes of the ferrite. So the ferrite will be tetragonal if there is carbon in solid solution. So when we look at the equilibrium phase diagram, we are looking at the equilibrium between cubic ferrite and austenite. So I thought, supposing that we examine the equilibrium between tetragonal ferrite and austenite, would the solubility of carbon change? And how do we do this? Well, when you don't have any method, you use first principles calculations. And sure enough, if I compare the solubility of carbon between cubic ferrite and austenite and between tetragonal ferrite and austenite, it's much, much larger. So because the lattice is tetragonal, the carbon does not have a motivation to escape to the le levels with the conventional iron carbon phase diagram. Of course, these are calculations, right? So we need to actually do measurements, and we did those in uh, uh, synchrotron. And to cut a long story short, we detected the tetragonality, and as we heated up the sample to let uh, the equilibrium change towards cubic, uh, the C over A ratio tends towards 1. In other words, we get a transformation to cubic ferrite. There's an awful lot more I could talk about, which is uh, just uh, scientific outcomes rather than technology. But I mentioned to you that, uh, you know, we have heat treatment times from 80 milliseconds to 10 days, right? And that the 10-day heat treatment uses a lot less of the oomph or 
the atoms than the 80 milliseconds. And I also said that, look, if I transform that room temperature, it would take 100 years. So we made the material, which would take 100 years to transform. Here it is, with 1.75 weight percent carbon at room temperature. Sealed it up into a quartz tube with uh, inert gas. And the experiment started in 2004 and was finished in 2104. Okay. And there's a sample in the Science Museum in London which has been polished completely flat. So if it begins to transform, uh, you will see surface upheavals. Now, of course, um, I'm not going to live that long. So you have to tell this story to your children and your grandchildren and to visit the Science Museum in London to verify whether this is correct and whether you know, I actually deserve this uh, medal or not. So I'll be happy to answer questions. question is, you know, uh, is, there, is there an effect of the stress during the production of the flesh payment on the transformation itself? And I think uh, we can calculate that. And you would require a stress of the order of 200 megapascals to make a difference, whereas the roller tensions don't actually put that big a stress. No, no. Uh, this is the 100 year experiment. The, uh, I don't know whether I put up the composition or not, but it's available on my website. It's, it's approximately 0.958% carbon. Okay? Yeah, 0.958% carbon uh, because we can then transform it within the 10 days period. Professor Sok? Excellent question. So the question is that, you know, when the transformation happens, it generates its own heat. So does the temperature of the material rise during this allegedly 200 degrees C treatment? So in the longer presentation that I make on this subject, I talk about recalescence. Because, you know, the thermomechanical processing that goes on on hundreds of millions of tons, you can pick up a temperature rise as soon as the transformation happens. That means that you cannot achieve as fine a grain size as you would if recalescence wasn't there. So one of the design parameters is that the transformation must be slow enough to dissipate the heat because we are dealing with large components. And there's no issue of that because it's happening gently over a period of 10 days. But it is an issue if uh, so many people um, want to make this go faster. And I don't think there is logic in that because you do not introduce residual stresses from the transformation and so on. Uh, and many people over the world have accelerated the kinetics. So for example, we did some experiments where we added cobalt to accelerate the transformation. But it's only an advantage if you want to produce small components, otherwise you get recalescence. Very good question. So, you know, if we say that bainite has tetragonality, then what is the difference with martensite, which also has tetragonality? So, uh, basically, bainite is forming at a temperature 
where the carbon can escape. So we have about 0.958% carbon, but we are left with about 03 So it's as if it is martensite, but it's being tempered during the process. And you know, John Spear uh, in uh, Colorado School of Mines invented this quench and partitioning process in which he quenches the steel between the MS and MF temperatures and then raises the temperature so that the carbon from the martensite can partition into the austenite and produce a mixture of tempered martensite and austenite. So in principle, there is no difference except the temperature at which the bainite forms and also because the driving force is lower, the plates are finer. My pleasure.